Monica, thanks so much for joining us today. It's been a while. It's so nice to finally see you again, even though it's not, you know, face to face. So tell us a little bit about what, what you're doing down in Broward County in regards to you're teaching fourth grade this year. Yes, I am. Yes. So, so is it science? I mean, what does a fourth grade student start learning about in, in science? What does your curriculum look like? Uh, so we cover all the components, of course. There is a Flor Florida component as well, the history of space exploration, the impact of it on Florida history and economy. Um, so there's definitely a way to link it to the curriculum um, on the fourth grade level. Do your students do they spend part of the time with you and part with another teacher or do you teach them all day long? So I have it's general ed setting. I have them all day long with the exception of specials. Um, so they do reading my science social studies with me. Excellent, excellent. Um, how long have you taught in Florida? We know you've taught for uh, at least 20 years, but how long of the, how much of that has been in S South Florida? Uh, so I want to say 17 years. I started in a charter school for three years, and then um, I was hired by Orange Brook Elementary, a public school in Broward. I uh, spent 14 years there, and just recently transitioned to a different school, Central Park Elementary, where I teach fourth. Okay. So what do you think is the most challenging? When I think back to science in fourth grade, you know, we get to do, I just remember things like the solar system. I remember, you know, kids always like dealing with dinosaurs, but in a fourth grade setting, and I know you have to prep them at the same time for standardized tests. What, what does one cover in, in those areas in a fourth grade? Because I think a lot of us forget what that's like to be a fourth grade student. Um, basics, so life cycles, right? Um, uh, we talk about Space to the extent of just the uh, solar system, types of planets, uh, what causes day and night, what causes seasons. Uh, we obviously talk about the um, scientific discovery and um, the scientific method all throughout. Um, resources in Florida and how they're used, renewable, non-renewable resources. Um, so all of it is linked to you know, our community. Sure. And, and those topics you listed, they're important in uh, aerospace. For instance, if your kids design a settlement, all of those factors tie into how do you build a, you know, a station or a settlement out there. Just curious, when you're teaching the seasons, do you use any props to teach your kids? Do you, do you walk around with a beach ball? I know a teacher that walks around with a big Classic. beach ball uh, <laughs> to teach the seasons. I, I don't know, do you, do you use any props? Well, I show them seasons. So what I do is uh, I either use a Skype the scientist or the scientist in every Florida school resource where we connect with scientists in other states. So I always make sure I pick a state that's um, very diverse in terms of the weather patterns um, mm -hmm. to Florida. Um, and just, was it was two years ago, yes, I was able to show them, you know, the leaves, the different colors of leaves during the fall um, or snow. Uh, and I know we look at these as such basic things, but many of my students have never experienced snow, right? Oh, yeah. Just the concept of changing seasons, it's so abstract to them living in Florida where we have wet and dry. Um, so little things like that, just um, you know, finding a contact somewhere else in the country and, and showing them that this is what it is. So not only using models in the classroom that you mentioned, but also seeing it. I didn't see snow until I was like 44 years old and I grew up in Florida. So I know exactly what you mean. I mean, I would only see it in my head from reading, you know, so having those experiences, I think early on are, are ones that will help them to understand more. So Im I, and I imagine that having to balance between what you have to do for testing and then getting them engaged, how do you manage to engage a young, what is it? What grade, a fourth grade ten, what age is that? Like seven? Ten, ten, no, they're 10 years old. 10 years old. So mm -hmm. how in the, how do you manage to engage kids? Like, what is it that your philosophy, your classroom teaching philosophy to engage them to be able to focus and also still learn? So I cannot imagine not bringing up the topic of space in a Florida classroom. Like the possibilities of integrating space exploration with other subject areas are countless. Um, and I feel that you can easily adapt any space related content to reflect your grade level standards. So for example, this week alone, I was preparing a reading lesson on interpreting information presented visually and orally, which includes you know, char charts, graphs, diagrams, timelines, animations, or websites. 
and explain how their information contributes to an understanding of a text in which they appear. And this particular standard has a cognitive complexity of level three, which is considered one of the harder skills to master. So given the historic landing of Perseverance, I incorporated NASA online resources, including 3D interactive model of the rover, video animations of the seven minutes of terror, maps of Jezero Crater, diagrams of the science instruments carried by the rover, charts, lists, and more as a means to practice the standard. So um, it was not an easy content to manipulate. Uh, yet, because of the nature of it, my students were totally fascinated by it. One of the groups was asked to use Minecraft Education Edition, a tool we often use, to create a Jezero Crater replica to scale using the virtual Mars world uh, already available in Minecraft. So just think about the complexity of the task mathematically for this particular grade level. Uh, motivation was not an issue, of course. Right. And right. I mean, you gamify it like that, it really brings it to their level and they get so excited. Math skills, right? I mean, so many skills. And we wrap up the day building capsule prototypes to simulate perseverance landing using the engineering design process and simple health of matrix design. Um, my online students use Tinkercad, which is a free online 3D modeling program to achieve the same goal. We tested the prototypes and concluded that they enjoying the Mars donuts. Thank you, Krispy Kreme, such a brilliant idea. <laughs> Do you um, have one by you? We, we don't have one up here. Is there one down there? Yes. Oh man, you lucked out. I know they ran out very quickly. So, you know. so, so you integrated that whole unit with all those different, um, the the you know across the curriculums kind of thing. And so, when they did they watch it land? How did I mean? Obviously, it happened later in the afternoon. But how did they yeah. did they go home and watch it? So, and of all days, this was an early release to us. Uh, so we ended the day at noon. Um, but their homework <laughs> for the day was. To watch it and then for those of them who missed it we watched it the next day and so what was this, their takeaway we had about it was um how did we know that the perseverance landed i mean there was no video footage right there was no audio footage per se so um it was amazing for them to realize that this was basically number analysis data analysis this is how we knew that it ha what happened happened uh which again links to that standard beautifully right analysis and um, analyzing numbers, data, charts, graphs. Um, so um, there's just so much to discuss in this topic alone. So um, while it was a bit abstract to them, you know, I used a lot of um, animation to show them what it was supposed to be in real life. Um, but I think it, as a result, they were, they were able to gain an appreciation for, again, science, math, and, and how cool it is in a, con in a context of, of perseverance. Yeah, it is conceptual, right? Because we, I didn't even think about the fact that what we were looking at wasn't really happening. That's just an, a rendering based on data that's coming back. And that that is such a hard concept, I think, in general. So that's an incredible skill. Did they feel they, uh, were they as excited as maybe you were or as maybe Kevin was, or I think adults in general? Donuts helped, but yeah. they are... They were definitely excited. I mean, space is just a cool topic, right? As it is. Um, so they're, they're memorized by it. They're fascinated by it. Um, like I said, motivation was not an issue. They were in and, you know, and they want to learn more. Right. I, I enjoy um, standing up next to a big monitor and pausing the little short video animations and ask, you know, why spin up your spacecraft before you point it towards Mars? And, and as soon as the kids recognize they can't throw a football without spinning it, you know, you can't throw it accurately, they realize that. Um, and also uh, the orbital mechanics, there's so many good re resources out there. Now, I know you're a JPL solar system ambassador. Did, yes. did your connection to JPL provide you any secret uh, extra resources <laughs> that maybe the average teacher did not have access to? Well, there are many benefits of being one. Uh, one of them is being invited to frequent webinars conducted by experts in the area. We also, um, Kay likes to tend, uh, send us a box of goodies, including calendars uh, and an infographic about Mars, which I share with my students. Um, so it, it's, definitely, it's definitely a plus to be a member of this special group. Right. I think the most important vocab word that I introduced to my aerospace kids uh, on landing day was alluvial uh, fan. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was a good one. And 
then I had them compare it to say New Orleans and the Louisiana Delta because mm -hmm. it, it was very, it became very obvious to them with that false color image that was in some of the perseverance um, uh, content that that's exactly the way we see deposits on earth as moving bodies of water slow down as they enter a lake or an ocean. So I thought that was a, that was one of the more easy things to connect to the kids in the class. And the whole discussion about why Delta, right? Why this crater? Because right. what does it have that other areas of Mars don't? Mm -hmm. um, so we had a big discussion on that. What is it that you can find in that area because of what it was? Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, so again, 10 year, 10 year old kids can have these discussions and they can draw conclusions and they can get hooked on space because of it. You know, I think what you just said is very important. The idea that 10 year old kids can do something right and I know that that's really always been Kevin's philosophy with the idea of building satellites is that kids can do uh, hard work so when you think to some of the challenges that you have having that idea that philosophy of stretching kids beyond their their limits so to speak what are some of the biggest challenges you have to get all of your kids on board with that you know in a public school setting in the course of my career, I noticed that regret regrettably, many exciting academic experiences are available only for middle or high schools, and that elementary students are left out in the process. Um, and just to give a random example, like the Growing Beyond Earth Maker Contest, for example, which focusing, focuses on maintaining plants without human intervention, is only designed for high schools, which could be easily adapted and used in an elementary setting. Um, so I found an amazing initiative. It's called the Scientists in Every Florida School, which is led by the Thompson Earth Systems Institutes, which matches scientists with K-12 public schools in Florida. And this program also provides high quality professional development for, uh, for teachers. But through this partnership, I was able to connect with scientists representing the racial and cultural backgrounds of all of my students to share their expertise and personal stories about becoming scientists. Last year, I connected with um, then a doctoral candidate, now Dr. Drake Garner, uh, to set up a Growing Under the Rainbow project, which aimed at addressing plant blindness and plant responsiveness to various types of light using LED plant growth boxes. And this experience taught students about plant science, biotechnology, the scientific method, and the potential implications in sustaining life in space. Um, and this year, um, again, thanks to the scientists in Ever Florida School, I was able to form a partnership with the University of Florida's Engineering School of Sustainable Infrastructure and Environment and connect with Dr. Gurley. Uh, together, we led students in researching the local phenomenon, hurricanes, and then using basic design principles and materials to create a prototype of a hurricane house. Uh, we are right now at the stage where students' prototypes have been built, and we are about to ship them the UF to be tested in the university's wind channel for their endurance. So while this is not directly connected to a space related content, it can easily be adapted as such. The key component here is the interaction with actual scientists and engineers and engaging students in a project where they are perceived as engineers themselves. And based that's, on the- Oh, I, I was gonna say, I think that's exactly what I found fascinating about that identity factor. The fact that you had mentioned when you were hooking them up or, um, getting people to speak who looked like they do, right? So the yes. idea of girls, the idea of people of color, girls of color, right? Uh, being able to see someone who looks like them in that field, is everything. helps them to recognize that they can do that, right? So so tell me a little bit more about your um, your hurricane experience. Obviously that gets, a, a, I mean, weather in general, the kids, right? So what do we have here, just those hurricanes? So when you find that out and they're doing these real hands-on experiments like that do they see themselves do they tell you that they are more interested in those kinds of fields because of that hands-on work yes and based on what i'm hearing from my students and their parents they do send me notes every now and then i know that it's very empowering uh, to to them and quite a few of my students mentioned that they would want to explore careers that they have been exposed to through our interactions with scientists um, i feel like um we as educators sometimes tend to fall into the talking about science um, versus let's do, let's live science. We are scientists. The moment we start making observations, drawing conclusions, changing variables, adjusting variables to gain what we want, we are scientists, right? There's no minimum right. age required. You don't need permission from somebody to be one. And I feel like um, 
kids tend to think that they need a permission, that they need to maybe look a certain way or achieve certain things before they are considered a scientist. And in fact, no, a fourth grade classroom is a scientific experiment, uh, if you let it be. Um, so um, I shifted my thinking, you know, over the years too, that um, again, instead of talking about, we live it, we experience it, we modify you, it. You mentioned that you shifted your thinking too. And I know that in teaching throughout the years, I've come across some teachers who are kind of fixed in their mindset and they like to do things a certain way. So how do you, how do you work with colleagues who might not have that same philosophy or do you just find the ones who are like you and just take it, you know, take it on? So I guess it's all about your why in a sense, right? It's why do you teach? What is your ultimate purpose? Um, and yes, sometimes, you know, teachers come with different reasons to teach, right? Um, but um, to me, inquiry-based space exploration, like, uh, and I use the robotics, which we can discuss in a few, to me, it just engages higher order thinking, problem solving, productive struggle, tolerance for ambiguity, and cooperative learning. And isn't tolerance for ambiguity like the essence of adulthood, right? We need to prepare our students to be comfortable with uncertainty, unpredictability, with conflicting directions, with multiple demands. So in like images, they need to know how to operate effectively in an uncertain environment. Yeah, and, and failure too, right? right? Like I know you oh, mentioned yeah. that a lot too. Like sometimes they just have to be okay with this didn't work out. So now what do I do to see it sure. as a way to readjust as opposed to give up? Yeah, um, fail early, fail fast, learn from your mistakes. So, well, tell us a little bit more about your robotics. So, I mean, obviously, first robotics is something that is is pretty well known, but not necessarily with the younger kids. Like you point out, it. it I know that Kevin had that same problem with middle school not being recognized. You know, it was just a high school. So, little bit by little bit, more uh, has he's been able to do more with middle school. You're at that same issue of ageism, as he calls it. It's like reverse ageism, where you've got kids that could do the work, but we just assume that they can't. So with robotics, while that's something that's a little bit more common, what are you doing with young people in robotics like that? And also I think the perception that robotics is for certain groups of people that maybe gifted students are the perfect audience of it. I think about it too, right? These stereotypes. Um, well, computer science to me and robotics is like yet another field that has so much cross curricular potential. Um, so I have worked with many robotic platforms over the years, including Vex IQ, Legos Mindstorms, uh, Legos Spike Prime, CodeBots with Furia Labs, Junior Botball, um, or even like Finch with brain, bird brain technologies. And so I challenge students to create, for example, to create rovers using any of the robots available to perform various missions on terrains resembling Moon or Mars. Um, and I feel that participation in STEM activities and robotics again, boost students' motivation, engagement, confidence. And again, this is evident to me and I witness it daily. I even feel that students who have been struggling academically and behaviorally are often placed in my classroom because I have a great record of positively changing their attitude toward learning um, by engaging them through STEM. Um, I think a lot of kids get turned off by standard education. You know, the idea that they we're just, as you said earlier, we're just learning about it. We're not doing it. And if we can find a way to even help those who don't see themselves as a scholar, you know, or the best student in the class, give them something to be excited about, that that really makes an impact. I know we're getting fairly close to the end of uh, this session, but Kevin, did you want to talk with her about any of the other contests or the? No, I just I remember a conversation I think we had when you were at a camp maybe a year and a half ago, and I. If there was a contest you wanted to enter, I'm pretty sure I encourage you just to say the kids were a certain age and uh, sure. enter them. Because uh, like you, I agree with you that there are a number of opportunities there, but they put the bottom in because they think students of a certain age cannot uh, participate. But I think the students take that as a challenge, right? Agreed. If they're not expected to win because this is say high school and their middle school, or it's a middle school competition in their elementary, then all the better, right? Uh, why not? Uh, I, think, I think you might agree, and I've heard you share some things, helping kids not be risk averse, you know, not being afraid to try. That's, I think that's the best we can hope is that they're, not only are they curious and they're critically thinking, but they're also very 
much not afraid to try something new because that you know that's when we learn. So, um, what are the most important things coming up as far as your school year now from now till May? I know you're probably in a hybrid model of school as well. So, are there any important uh, competitions or events that you have planned for your students this spring? Um, and also just Kevin to address what you just said. Also, I feel like elementary schools are super important because we are in this one big pool, right? The moment kids go to middle school, they start thinking about um, their favorite subjects, right? So if I don't get them in elementary, I feel they will miss out. So if I don't show them STEM, if I don't expose them to coding or programming early on, they will not choose it in middle school. Um, so again, it's just on that note, I feel like it's so important to Mm -hmm. um, at elementary students to that thank you sure. um so in terms of projects um like i said we are looking forward to testing our hurricane houses um i also again if there are any educators who are not members of the civil air patrol i, I strongly encourage them to join there's like a nominal fee but it allows you to receive awesome stem kits um which are um address space right um aviation and cyber concepts. So we have a lot of those kits that we are working on, including uh, solar powered vehicles, which again, relates to space. Mm -hmm. um, our county, we have a great Broward STEM department, which designs uh, quarterly challenges for students in the area of coding related to space sometimes, uh, or sustainability which again links to space exploration, if you let it be. Uh, so students are engaged in uh, various challenges involving Minecraft Education Edition, where they have to create um, a biome, for example, that's uh, sustainable using um, resources available. Um, uh, there is a Mars, I don't know, not Mars biome, Mars world, right? Where kids can uh, build a rover and make sure that um, they create uh, an environment where they can survive. Um, there is also a great replica of ISS in Minecraft where um, kids can, um, if you link certain experiments through, throughout, they are literally in ISS um, um, attempting the tasks and hopefully solving them successfully. Uh, so we're doing little things here and there sparkled throughout, right? Um, uh, we also always uh, create uh, different projects, engineering design projects, uh, rovers, uh, we're using robots to achieve that, or sometimes just simple maker supplies. Um, so as far as the big, big projects, other than the hurricane house at this moment, uh, we're just doing little projects throughout. Do you have, how do you get those into, I mean, I know that you join these groups and they send them to you, but do, do you have any struggles getting materials in public schools? Do you have to worry? I mean, I, that's something that we've never really had to worry about being in a private school. That's one of those things. But I, I remember being in public school, it was a lot harder to be able to provide those opportunities for my kids. I am an avid grant writer, uh -huh. <laughs> which I know takes time. And that's a commitment I'm willing to take, right? Um, because it pays off. Um, but like going back to Civil Air Patrol, again, for a nominal fee, you, you will gain access to free STEM kits. I just uh, learned about Civil Air Patrol myself, and I'm not quite in that field, but I saw a post on, on social media, and I thought it was pretty great. I mean, yes. so that's good. As we are getting ready to close, if you had to give some advice to teachers, I know that you're, you know, you are, you're a teacher, you know, like us who believes really about what's best for the kids, but you're always out there working too. And obviously that's one of the reasons why you're going to be recognized very soon. You'll find out if what your Broward teacher of the year and a couple of other things you're up for. If there were other teachers out there that you wanted to encourage today, what's your, what's your top piece of advice for them? Be a lifelong learner, be open. Um, hopefully you are a lifelong learner already being an educator. Um, so continue doing that. Find a group of people uh, that can support you, right? Offer advice if needed. Um, and also just remember that, think about students as a center of of the universe for you professionally, right? Um, our job is to make sure that they are immersed in education experiences that nurture curiosity, question status quo, embrace mistakes, and empower their voices. Um, so I guess that that would me just remember your why. Mm. That's really good. well said. 
All right. Well, we're going to end that here. We're going to thank you so much for joining us. I hope that uh, we, we see some good news popping up for you in the next few weeks. I love, I don't know if you know this about Monica, but she's also an amazing photographer, a nature photographer. And uh, thank you. some of her photos are just, they belong in, in magazines, uh, you know? So, all right, well, we'll, we'll be talking with you again soon. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, today we had the uh, the great privilege to interview our friend Monica Mormon, a teacher in Broward County, Florida. She teaches fourth graders. She is a rock star. She really uh, blends the uh, environmental science and uh, she is obviously a space junkie and a STEM enthusiast. The two things that I found most uh, memorable about what she said is that we, we need to always encourage our colleagues to be lifelong learners, mm. which hopefully they are. And, um, and it was either you or her that said that you should find a cohort of like-minded people. I think maybe you said that. Well, I think, I think what it is, is it's, um, you know, I think we recognize that there, not everybody is maybe as dedicated to doing whatever you need to, or putting in the hours that you need to, in order to get something done. And so when you find uh, you know, people who are like-minded, people who can kind of feed off of that same enthusiasm. It really, it makes your job much more pleasant and more of a passion than, you know, than just going to work. I think for me, uh, you know, I, I was so happy to meet Monica when we had that teacher grant, you know, thing. And I was so surprised at how many teachers didn't show up, you know, how many people, even if you paid them, I, I, I mean, being a former public school teacher, it was shocking to me. So the fact that she not only came, especially with her kids being younger and not really at that material that we thought we were reaching out to, and that she seeks to be able to take higher level concepts and work with the younger people. I, I really love that she recognizes the identity factor, how she brings people who look like them to help them uh, recognize their potential. So I, I'm super glad that we've been able to be in contact with her and I look forward to working with her uh, in the future. As we say, let's, let's go, go to, to space. space.